We're going to continue our discussion and our study on the judgments of God. We're on the foundations. And last week, we talked about the foundations being right. We talked about gold. We talked about the Lord. And we talked about how that gold represents the deity of Jesus Christ. Today, we're going to go and look at the silver. So if you got your Bible, let's go to Psalm 66, verse 10. Psalm 66, verse 10. Psalm 66, verse 10. In Psalm 66, verse 10, the Bible says this, For thou, O Lord, o, for thou, O God, hast proved us, thou hast tried us as silver is tried. Now, silver in the Scriptures represents the price of redemption. The price of redemption. So let's look at some scriptures on that. But before we go there, I want you to notice in Psalm 66.10, the Bible says God has proved us. He has tried us as silver is tried. You take silver and you put it in that furnace and you try it. You put that fire to that thing. Okay? It's going to burn out all that dross. Which means all the impurities. Alright, the new birth does that. When Jesus Christ saved you, He burned out all the impurities that were in you that would keep you out of heaven. And He put on the inside of you a new man that is sinless, that is perfect, that is holy, that is pure, that is righteous, that is clean, that is always wanting to do what God says to do. So, preacher, I don't always feel like that. I understand that. That's because the old man is still there also. See, God put a dirty trick on you. He put two opposite types of people on the inside of you. The old man and the new man. And they're like two chihuahuas going at it. Amen. The old man and the new man, and they are fighting each other. Um, I don't know if I should tell this or not. Where I grew up at, we were so poor, we didn't have a whole lot to do when I was growing up down in Duplin County, so we created things to do. And one time we took two cats and... <laughs> I don't know if I should tell this or not. I took two cats and uh, we tied their tails together and we... <laughs> And we let them go at it and hung them on the clothesline, different things. And, and boy, what a mess that was. <laughs> I mean, uh, you should have seen the fur fly. That's like the old man and the new man. They get in the same room. They don't like each other. They don't want to be around each other. And you get them trapped in there and lock the door. But there's a fight going on. And that's what's going on in the inside of you. When you got saved, God put a new man in there and locked the door. <laughs> And now you got a problem. You got two opposing forces on the inside of one body, and they're fighting each other. But God says that He's going to try you as silver is tried. So what did He do? He put something holy on the inside of you so you could go to heaven. A lost man don't have that. Always remember that. A lost man is not happy. A lost man has not got any joy on the inside of him. A lost man does not have any um, uh, happiness about him. He, he's always uh, in, a, in a depressed mood, so to speak. Why is that? Because there's nothing alive on the inside of him. If you get over there at the funeral home, everybody's crying. Why? You're around a bunch of dead people. <laughs> I mean, they, they died. You know, you're getting ready to bury them. But God says, when you come to Jesus Christ, you're made alive. So there's joy unspeakable and full of glory on the inside of you at that point. 
See? All right, now let's look at some things about this gold. Go to Matthew 26. It's the price of redemption. Matthew 26. Look at verse 14. There's a peculiar thing that you'll notice in the scriptures about this too. Every time the Bible describes Judas Iscariot, it describes him as one of the twelve. Have you ever noticed that when you're reading your Bible? It always says one of the twelve, one of the twelve. Well, one plus twelve is what? And there just so happens to be 13 letters in his name. And it just so happens that the 13th chapter of John, I believe it is, describes the son of perdition. And that 13 shows up in connection to the Antichrist several times in your Bible. And when he's described, it's always described as one of the 12, Judas Iscariot. Why didn't he just say, then Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priest. Why does he say one of the twelve? They all know who he was. <laughs> Why didn't he say an apostle of Jesus Christ, Judas Iscariot? He only says one of the twelve. He's giving you a clue about something. He's giving you a clue of what he's connected to, the number 13, which is a bad number. It's a bad number, folks. You say you're superstitious? No, I'm biblical. 13 is a bad number. You go and look at that number in your Bible and you'll find out that it shows up several times and it's always connected to something evil. Think about it. (laughs) Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went into the chief priest and said to them, What will you give me? I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for what? Thirty pieces of what? It was sold for thirty pieces of silver. The price of a slave in the Old Testament. The price of a slave. And Jesus Christ was sold to redeem you. Take your Bible and go to Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 11. Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12. Now this is a prophecy about what you just read in Matthew. Verse 12. And I said unto them, If you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price thirty pieces of silver. The Lord said to me, Cast it into the potter, a goodly price that I was prized at of them. And I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. It's the price of redemption, folks. Price of redemption. So silver is something where... It's connected to you sharing the gospel with people. That's what I'm trying to show you in this. Go to Matthew again. Matthew chapter 27 this time. Matthew 27. Verse 6. Bible says in verse 6, And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for to put them into the treasury because it is the price of 
blood. And what will you redeem with? There you go. That's what it's connected to. They took counsel and bought them, bought with them the potter's field, just like you read Zechariah, to bury strangers in. Wherefore, the field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, and price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord appointed me. God told you in advance that Jesus Christ was going to be sold for 30 pieces of silver. That's the price of redemption. When you study the Old Testament out under the law, silver was the price of redemption. You redeemed something for, for silver. A slave was redeemed with silver. Silver is, that, num- is that, that metal that God used to redeem people with. All right, now go to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis 37. I'll show it to you again. Genesis 37, verse 28. The Bible says here in verse 28, this is the type of Christ again. Then there passed by Midianites, merchant men. And they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. See, that silver shows up several times in the Bible as a price for redemption. Now, the reason that I'm pointing this out to you is because when you read over there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where it brings up the silver, the gold, and the precious stones, the hay, the stubble, and so forth, it's showing you that that silver is connected to redemption. And the reason it's connected to redemption, as far as you're concerned, every time you share the gospel with somebody, you're laying that silver up in heaven. As a reward for you sharing the gospel with them. And you got to be, uh, your motive in sharing the gospel with them needs to be pure. Your motive is not to show off. Your motive is to sincerely try to win them to Jesus Christ, not to show how smart you are or how much Bible you know or how much Bible you think you know. It ought to be something where you're saying, look, I am sharing the gospel with you because I want you to go where I'm going. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven and I want you to go and be there with me. I'm looking for something else here. Let's see. Silver's a silver. Let's see. Five shekels of silver. Silver of the name. I can't show you that one right now. All right. All right. So, when we tell people about Jesus Christ and how to be saved and give them the plan of redemption, we're laying that silver up in heaven to our account. That's why Paul mentions silver in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It's connected to redemption. Now, if it's connected to redemption, every time you share the gospel with somebody, that silver is being added to your account in heaven. Okay? That ought to be a motivation to you to share the gospel with people. So what if they don't receive it? It didn't say they had to receive it. It says you had to tell them about it. We'll get to the ones that receive it in a minute. We ain't got there yet. We're talking about you opening your mouth and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with them, the plan of redemption with them. All right, that's the silver. We talked about the gold, now we hit the silver. Now let's hit the precious stones. Go to Malachi chapter 3. The precious stones. Now we're going to talk about the ones that actually receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. Malachi chapter 3 verse 17. Malachi chapter 3 verse 17. The Bible says, uh, well actually let's go back and look at verse 16. 
Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And that's a man that gets saved. A man that gets saved is a man that fears God. A man that fears God will get saved. It is the fear of the Lord that's the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And the Bible is talking about a group of people here in these verses that fear the Lord and think on His name. What name did you call on when you got saved? You called on the name of the Lord. And the Bible tells you in Romans chapter 10, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, that means you had to think about it, that means you had to think on it, were saved. So based on that, you read verse 17, and they shall be mine. Well, how did they become his? (laughs) They were redeemed. They were saved. They were justified. They were sanctified. Saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my what? There's those precious stones. And I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. See that thing? God will make a distinction there between those that are saved and those that are not. Those that are his and those that are not. And trust me, there is a huge distinction between the two. Alright, take your Bible and let's look at another one. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Look at verse... um, 1... The Bible says, Wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word. God's giving you a commandment there. You are to desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. If so be that you have tasted that the Lord is gracious to whom coming as unto a lively stone Excuse me, unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God, and precious, ye also as what? Lively stones. stones. Wouldn't you call a lively stone a precious stone? Okay. Lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices accepted to God by Jesus Christ. All right. Take take your Bible and look at Zechariah again. Zechariah chapter 9. Mm-hmm. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 16. their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people for they shall be as the stones of a crown how about that the stones of a crown lifted up as an ensign upon his land how great is his goodness how great is his beauty corn shall make the young men cheerful and new wine the maids now God says there that they're going to be as stones of a crown. If you look at those old medieval crowns, they have all these precious stones. If you go over to England today, they have an encasement there in one of the places there you can go in the, um, uh, what do you call it, that Buckingham Palace, and they've got crowns sitting in there that those old monarchs wore, and they had jewels in them. And depending on how many jewels are in those crowns, will determine just exactly how important they were as far as their kingship and their kingdom. Because the more land they won, 
the more jewels they put in those crowns. So when you go out and win souls for Jesus Christ, God adds those jewels to your crown. So the precious stones that Paul is talking about there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 are those souls you have personally, I say personally, won to Jesus Christ. Now some Christians will get to heaven and there's not going to be any stones in their crown. They're going to have an empty crown, brother. Because they can't tell you one person they've ever led to Jesus Christ. And they've been saved 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. God knows how long. And that's sad. I tell you, that is a bad testimony for a man that's been saved for any length of time and has never won anybody to Jesus Christ. Never had an impact positive enough to cause that person to want Jesus Christ in their heart. So it ain't got nothing to do with my side. I didn't say it did. But it's got something to do with your stewardship. And it's got something to do with what you ought to be doing for the Lord. And it's got something to do with determines whether you love Him or not. If you love me, you'll keep my word. <laughs> We've talked about that. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. We've talked about that. And didn't Jesus Christ tell you to go out and win people to Jesus Christ? Yes or no? Did He? Yes. He sure did. If you're not out there actively trying to win people to the Lord, what's your problem? <laughs> Amen. Win somebody. At least get one soul in the kingdom. Amen. These precious stones are souls who have been personally won to Jesus Christ. Now, now here we go. We talked about the crowns. We talked about the stones. We've talked about the gold. We've talked about the um, silver. Now let's talk a minute about the stubble and the hay. I got a scripture there behind that hay and stubble. Yeah. Give me a scripture. Hebrews nine fourteen. Go to Hebrews nine fourteen. I thought I wrote something on it. <laughs> Now, the hay and the stubble is dead works. That's you going out there with the wrong motive to do, try to do something because you're not trying to do it for the Lord. You're trying to do it to get people to look at you. Oh, he's so spiritual. He's so holy. He knows so much Bible. You know, look at him. And then in their mind is what their motive is and when they're talking to people. They want people to look to me. Look at what I am. Look at who I am. When you should be saying, look to Him. Look to who He is. Jesus Christ is the one I am pointing you to. Not Mark Anderson. I am not trying to get you to put your mind on me, your faith on me, your thoughts on me. I'm trying to put it to Jesus Christ. And if you don't do that in your personal work, when you're out there winning people or trying to win people to the Lord, you have got the wrong motive. Alright? Now with that being said, hold your place there. We ain't going to read it yet. I want you to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to show it to you. We're getting ready to go back to Hebrews, but go to 1 Corinthians 3 first. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And look down here at verse 13. The Bible says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what, what? What sort it is. Brother, God's going to judge your heart when you're up before Him. What was your motive in, in doing what you're doing? Were you doing what you did out there in the church work or in the world and all that kind of stuff? Were you doing it because you were trying to get praise and acclamation? Or were you trying to do it because you really wanted to win this person to Christ and you did what you did because you loved Jesus Christ? Now with that being said, look at Hebrews chapter uh, 9 verse 14. 
How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from what? Dead works. To serve the living God. God is wanting to purge out all the dead work that's going on in your life and what needs to remain is the good work that you're doing for the Lord. A pure heart. I like what um, a brother in Christ said to me yesterday. Uh, Danny Hood, I was out there um, at a birthday party yesterday and uh, we were sitting there talking about the Lord and sharing some things with each other and and something he said to me just, man, it just was a blessing to me. Uh, I don't think he even realized how good of a blessing it was to me. He said, brother, we were talking about fasting. Talking about, our, you know, we had called the church to a fast and we were talking about fasting for the Lord and different things we were doing. And, and he said, yeah, man, he says, um, when we do fasting, one of the things that they always reminded us of, fast with your heart, not your belly. There you go. Yeah. Boy, that is profound. You fast with your heart. What does that mean, folks? That means this. When I'm doing something like that for God, I'm doing it because I want to get close to God. I want to get to the heart of God. I want to get into the very presence of God with what I'm trying to do and get His attention. And I want my heart to be fasting along with my physical body. Now you'll get God's attention like that. You're not sitting there looking at the clock. Man, I got it. There it is, right there. I'm, I got two hours left. No, it's like, I'm, I, uh, thank you, Lord. I have given this up for you. I don't know what you're going to do, but I know you're going to do something great for us. Depending on what you're fasting about, God's going to answer that prayer. Brother, I'm telling you, we almost saw immediate results with that because I just came in contact with some people at work that, are, that came out of an independent Baptist church from where they were from and ain't in church nowhere and they're looking for a church. And what are we praying about here in that fast? We're praying about church growth and spiritual growth. And brother, God's going to send the people. I believe in that. I'm believing that. What's the next scripture? I can't see it in around here. Galatians 2.20. Go to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians 2.20. God's going to do something in this church this year. I'm believing that. Galatians 2.20. Here it is again. Listen to this. I am crucified with Christ. Now if you're not crucified with Christ, then everything you do is going to be in the flesh and it's going to burn up at the judgment. Now think about that. There's going to be a lot of people at the judgment seat of Christ said, Lord, I, I was a Sunday school teacher. I was a deacon. I was a preacher. I was a worker in the church. I was a bus driver. I mean, I hauled them in by the thousands. God says, let me see your heart. And when God opens the light on that heart, buddy, he's going to burn it all up. Now what you got to say? Well, I, I, uh, well, uh, <laughs> Jesus is the Lord. <laughs> I mean, he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. See that thing? But Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. When we're out there walking, like we talked about this morning, we walk by faith. The faith of the Son of God, yes, and your faith coupled with that. 
And those two things run parallel to each other. And you need to have both in order to do something for God and it count at the judgment seat of Christ. A pure heart, a humble spirit, and a love for God and a love for His Word. If you don't, you'll be hay and stubble at the judgment. Hay and stubble is going to burn up, folks. Why? Because God is a consuming fire. And He's going to burn everything up that's not like Him. And thank God your new man is just like Him or it burn it too. <laughs> that's why God's got to give you a new body that can live forever in eternal fire. Everybody's worried about going to hell because they're going to be on fire and in hell burning up. Guess what? When you get the presence of God for your eternity, you're going to be on fire too. The only difference is you won't burn up. They are. <laughs> I mean, they're, I mean you, you're not going to feel no pain. They are. Ain't you ever thought about that? Both places are on fire. <laughs> is, does your Bible not say God is a consuming fire? Yes or no? Okay. Does it not call his spirit? Uh, go to Hebrews. Go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1. Say something. Hebrews chapter 1. Let's see. Hold on just a minute. Maybe that's not it. Hold on a minute. Yeah, here we go. Hebrews chapter 1. Look at verse 7. And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers, you just like Jesus Christ. You're a flame of fire too. Didn't Jesus say he was the light of the world? Okay. You know what Jesus says about you? Hmm? You're light of the world. I'll give you a scripture on that real quick. You need to see this stuff. So people don't think about that. Um, about what we are in the Lord. Let's see if I can find it real quick and I'll give it to you. Let's see. Let's see. Maybe it's in Matthew. Let's see. Made a light. Moon's light. To give them light. There was a light. Find the body. There's a place in here that says, Ye are the lights of the world. If anybody can find that for me, I'll show it to you. Uh, I know it's in here. I've read it a few times, and I made some notes on it when I read it. I want to find it. It's in the gospel somewhere. I ain't going to spend too much time trying to find it, but as soon as I find it, I will give it to you. Let's see. This is John. Let's see. I am the light. I am the light. I am the light. I light. Light, believing light. You may be the children of light. I am coming to light. I can't find it right now. Might be in Colossians. Let's see. All right, I'll find it later and show it to you. Anyway, you are just like the Lord. And that flame of fire that He is is what you are because you're just like Him. You take on the image of Jesus Christ. My point in saying that is this you are what He is, so you do what He does. And when you get out here, you do not want to produce hay and stubble and offer it for the Lord. When I get before the Lord, I do not want to lay at His feet stuff that is trash. I want to lay something good and eternal at His feet that He'll be well pleased in. Amen? Brother Jack, did you find it? Several Let's see, Matthew 5.14. That sounds about right, right there. 5.14. See, there's several places in there where it says that. 5.14. I knew it was. 5.14. Let's see. 
Yep, this is the one I'm looking for right here. Matthew 5.14, look at it. Make a note there. Now Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Then he tells you there in Matthew 5.14, what does that first word say? Ye. That's, that's you. <laughs> Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. You are. Well, how is that possible? That's possible because of who lives on the inside of you. Remember, what does the moon... That when you look out at the stars at night and you look out there at the moon at night, does the moon light up? Does it? Yes or no? Does the moon light up at night? Yes or no? Yes. It lights up. But it don't have its own light. Okay? But when you look out there at night, it's lit up. Right? It lights, it puts its light back toward the earth. But the light that the moon has, it don't have its own light, folks. It produces light as a result of reflecting the light of the sun. That's a picture of Jesus Christ and the church. Jesus Christ is the sun and the church is the moon. Okay? Now I'm just giving you a devotional here. And that light is not obscured by anything. It reflects it back to the earth. Ye are the lights of the world. You reflect the sun of Jesus Christ, the light of Jesus Christ. You show that to people. The point that God is making here is that when you do that, you've got to have a pure motive in what you're doing. You love God, you love His Word, and you want to win people to Christ because you love souls. Any kind of other motive is going to burn up. It's going to burn up. What was the other scripture there, brother? Do what now? Galatians 5, which is the service of the flesh. Yeah, let me give it. Yeah, Galatians 5. All right, we're going to look at that in a minute. Yeah. Now, what were you saying, Brother Jack? John 8, 14. John 8, 14. Let's look at it. And then we'll move on to this in Galatians. All right. John 8, 14. 8.12, okay, 8.12, all right. The Bible says, Then spake Jesus again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So you've got to walk in the Lord. That's the key, folks. And even you, after you're saved, you must continuously make that a conscious thing in your heart and in your mind. I am not walking in darkness. I am walking in light. When I do something, I'm doing it because I love the Lord. Now, another thing that we talked about yesterday was real good was this. The Lord impressed on uh, Brother Danny. He said, listen, pray about everything you do. Pray always. Pray about everything. I mean, when you go to the gas pump. <laughs> pray. When you get up in the morning, pray. When you go to supper, pray. When you go to dinner, pray. When you go to breakfast, pray. When, you, when you're out there mowing your lawn, pray. When you're trying to make a decision about something, pray about it before you make the decision. When you're thinking about things you want to do for the Lord, pray about it and ask God to show you His direction in the matter. When you're out there wanting to date, you, you people in here that are trying to find a uh, help me, you pray about that person. You pray God will send you the right person. Don't just pick and choose and think that, oh, well, you know, um, let the lots fall where they may. You might wind up with the wrong lot. And then you'll be stuck. <laughs> and then you'll be trouble in the paradise, and paradise will become hell. <laughs> I'm just telling you. Now, look, the work that's going to burn up at the judgment is described in Galatians chapter 5. These kind of things here... You do not want in your life. Because if you have them in your life, they're going to burn up. They're found in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. 
And we're going to go down to verse 22. Galatians chapter 5 verse 19 says, Now the works, everybody say works, of the flesh. Notice he didn't say the fruit of the flesh. Notice how he switched the words there. When he talks about the Spirit, he says it's the fruit of the Spirit. But when he hits that flesh, he says it's the works of the flesh. Did you notice that? Alright, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery. Let me tell you something. God is still opposed to adultery. Amen. 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 God does not want you married people messing around on your spouse. That is against God's Word and His law. Adultery is still forbidden according to the Holy Scriptures. Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery in his heart. Amen, amen, amen. (laughs) And you better... Take heed to that because there's plenty of people out there that will open the door for you to walk through that trap, especially in this society. And God's Word is warning you that is a work of the flesh that will burn up at the judgment seat of Christ. Next thing, fornication. Hmm. I'm going to say it and I'm going to say it real clear. I'm going to say it real biblical. I'm going to say it where nobody can bat an eye and figure it out. It's the way it is. It is still a sin in the eyes of God for you to shack up with somebody you're not married to. Amen. Fornication is still forbidden in the Bible. Amen. Amen. We need to teach our young people this. Because the young people that's coming up through the ranks now think it's okay to sleep around. They think you got to uh, try out the relationship before you marry them. And that includes sexual impurity. Let me tell you something. God is still telling you that is a sin and He rejects it and He's opposed to it. And if you get involved in that and get caught up in that, it will burn up at the judgment seat of Christ. It will burn up any kind of rewards you had laid up for you. Fornication is still a sin. Amen. I know a lot of Christians are out there playing around with it, but it don't make it right. Let's read another one. Uncleanness. Anybody have a problem with that one? (laughs) Keep your mind clean. Keep your heart clean. Keep your spirit clean. Keep your soul clean. How do you do that, preacher? You stay in the Word of God. You stay around clean people. You separate yourself from unclean people. A person that's a fornicator is an unclean person. Amen. Kind of quiet in here now, but I'm, I'm just telling you the way. I know what the news is saying. I know what the world is saying. I know what Hollywood says. I know what the music industry says. But they're going to go to hell. Don't go and join in with them in this filthiness because if you do, when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, anything you ever tried to do for God is going to burn up. It's going to burn up. Lasciviousness. Anybody know what that means? How many of you don't know what that means? It's okay if you don't. If you don't know what that means, raise your hand. Okay, all right, let me share with you what that means. That means an uncontrollable appetite for that which is ungodly. Specifically, it has a sexual connotation to it. Okay? Now, that means you have an uncontrollable appetite for things that are contrary to what God says you should have a desire for. Which is basically lust. An uncontrollable lust for things that God has told you not to be a part of. God says if you get that uh, if you get that ball rolling in your heart, it'll burn up at the judgment seat of Christ. I didn't say you would burn up. I said it will burn up anything you did for the Lord. Don't get caught up in it and lose your reward. 
Listen to what he says next. Idolatry. Now I know what we think about when we hear that. We think about statues. Right? Everybody thinks about a statue somewhere that you bow down to and you kiss like when you see in the Catholic Church or something, you know, you bow down to the statue of Mary or Joseph or some other saint and you kiss their feet and all that. But it goes deeper than that, folks. If you put anything before God, that is an idol. You say example? Would you like some examples? Like your spouse. Like your children. If you put your children before God, God says that's an idol. If you put your job before God, that's an idol. If you put yourself before God, that becomes an idol and you are an idolater. You're just as bad as any pagan out there bowing down to a physical statue. You're, you're just as guilty as they are. These guys are looking in the mirror and saying, man, man, look at that. Just look at that body. Man, I've been just... Mm, just <laughs> I know how it goes. I know how it goes. And they say, I don't have time today, preacher, to go to church because my favorite game's on. You know what you just did? You put that game before God and you said that game is God in your life. Amen. That game became your idol. Preacher, I don't have time today to pray. And read my Bible. I'm going to go fishing. That fish became your idol. You're just as guilty as the Pope is. Most people in our circles, they can't stand the Roman Catholic Church. And I understand that. But I'm going to tell you something. You making those other things idols in you, you're just as dirty and rotten and unclean as they are. I'm trying to push you folks to put God first in everything. When you get up in the morning, put Him first. When you go to bed at night, put Him first. When you go throughout your day, put Him first. When you come on Sunday morning, put Him first. Hey, I know you don't always feel like coming to church. You think I do? But when you stay home because you don't feel like it, you know what God is saying to you? You've made yourself an idol. Amen. Preacher, I ain't got time to pay my tithes this week. I got a light bill to pay. You know what you've done? You've made that bill an idol in your life. How about it? Amen. Because God told you, don't you rob Him. And when you don't do that, you rob God. And you put your bills and your needs and your wants before the Lord. It's dangerous. That's an idol. Next thing we talk about here, witchcraft. You know what witchcraft is? It's not always somebody out here wearing a robe, playing hocus pocus. It's not always Harry Potter, although that is included. Witchcraft is manipulating somebody to do what you want them to do trying to control somebody to do something you want them to do. That is witchcraft. And there's a lot of witchcraft being practiced inside the walls of churches. There's a lot of witchcraft being practiced in Christian homes. I don't have to force my wife to do anything. Amen. Amen. I am the head of my home. You understand that? And when I am the head, I don't tell her what to do. I lead by example on what I should be doing and what she should be doing. And because I do what Christ says to do, it ought to put a heart desire for her to follow. She is to follow me as I follow Christ. And that's the way Christian homes should be led. It's not do as I say, not as I do, but it is follow me as I follow Christ. Let me show you the example of how a Christian ought to live and how a Christian ought to walk and how a Christian ought to talk and how a Christian ought to be. Don't 
tell your family to go to church when you don't. Amen. Don't tell your family to read the Bible when you ain't opened it up. Don't tell your family to get on their knees and pray over something when you don't pray yourself. Don't you tell your family to love God when you don't love Him. You better lead by example because if you don't and you're trying to manipulate them to do those things outside of being the example of what Christ said to do, you're practicing witchcraft. And the Bible says about witchcraft it's going to burn up at the judgment seat of Christ. How about hatred? I stabbed that one for a little while. we got about ten minutes. I'll try to get through all of these. Hatred. A lot of Christians out here got hatred. Amen. They hate people. They hate what God's doing in their life. They hate what God's doing for them. They hate what uh, God's doing in other people's lives. So they look at them and they hate them. While they smile at them and tell them they love them. <laughs> but in secret, that's an I hate your guts. When the Bible says you should love the brotherhood, you should love your brothers. As a matter of fact, the Bible goes a step further than that. He says, you should love what? You should love your enemies. You should love your enemies. So there's no doubt about it. You should love the brotherhood. You should love those that are saved. I didn't say you had to agree with them. I didn't say you had to be cozy cozy with them. But I did say you had to love them. And how do you love them, brother? You love those that are difficult, that are saved, by praying for them. Amen. You pray for them, and if they need something and you can help them out, help them. Help them. Help them. Read something to you here. Hold on just a minute. Amen. That's exactly right, my brother. You gotta love those that are difficult to love. Give me just a minute here. I want to look at something here. Here's another one that we um, going to hit at variance. Now, this one's a little more subtle, but it happens a lot more in church than that than what you would imagine. The word is variance. How many of you know what variance means? Let me see your hands. How many of you don't know what it means? Let me see your hands. <laughs> it's okay. That's, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to teach you something. Variance means strife. It means debate. It means uh, argumentative. It means somebody that's always looking to find fault with you. They find fault with everything that's going on around them. They find people, they find things, and they nitpick it. And they find things about that that are wrong, and they want to just constantly point out the flaws of others. And Jesus Christ addressed that. He said, why are you trying to cast the little... Uh, what about your brother? I mean, you got a big old boulder. I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing now. You're trying to get this this big this this little thing out of your brother's eye, but you got something bigger in yours. Get the thing out of your eye first, and then you can see clearly to get theirs out. You know what I'm talking about? You know what that scripture is? It's in Matthew. Go to Matthew. Matthew chapter five. I think it's chapter five. It might be chapter six. Let's see. I'll find it. Let's see. Somebody help me find that verse. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yes. No? That's not the one I'm looking for. The one where it talks about the moat in your brother's eye. Hold on now. I'll, find, I'll look it up. Give me just a second. I'll find that moat. It's going to be Matthew 7. Let 
Matthew 7. Look at verse 3. The Bible says in verse 3, Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Now a mote is like a splinter, like a small little thing like this. It's real small. And you're, you're, you're worried about that in your brother's eye. But while you're worried about that in his eye, you've got this big beam sticking out of your eye. And then Jesus is giving that illustration to prove a point. He's saying, look, while you're out here fighting and fought with all of these people, why don't you look at yourself? Look at what's going on in your own heart. Look at what's going on in your own heart and your own life and get that straight first and then you will be able to spiritually help those that have the little splinters. Look at this again. Look at verse 4. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the moat out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. See that thing? And that's so important. That's variance. That's a man that's always trying to correct others. When there's something spiritually wrong with himself that he's, um, he's missing something. And if you've got that kind of situation going on, the Bible says you need to get that straight. Because if you don't, at the judgment seat of Christ, the things that you did, for, they're going to burn up. They're going to burn up. That's variance. That's variance. Emulations. Ah, there's another good word. I'm going to read you what the... Uh, dictionary says on it so that there's no misunderstanding. Uh, emulations is another thing that a lot of Christians have issues with. And if you get a Webster's 1828 dictionary, you can look these words up and write them out in your Bible. That would be a good dictionary for you to have. Uh, it's an 1828 Webster's Dictionary. You can get them for Brother Ruckman's church. If you want to get one through the church, I can get a discount for you. And there will be something good for you to have so that when you run across some of these words in your Bible, you can quickly look them up and figure out what they actually mean. I'm going to give you a good working definition if I can find this scripture. Hold on just a minute. Give me just a minute. By the way, it's only found one time in your Bible, and that's there in Galatians. That's kind of interesting, ain't it? <laughs> I talked about it one time there, but when he talked about it, he talked about it real good. Let's see, 22. If, uh, give me just a second here. Give you a good working definition here. It means an unfavorable uh, jealousy towards someone. It means to have an indignation or jealous attitude towards somebody else because of what God is doing in their life. That's an emulation. An emulation means that you look on somebody else and you man, well... Look at them. They think they're all that in a bag of chips. and Well, nothing's happening in your life, but you're jealous because God is blessing them. That's an emulation. And there's a lot of Christians that are jealous of other Christians in the church today because God's doing something for them. Well, if you hadn't been sitting on, uh, on there like a knot on a log for the last 30 years, maybe God would do something for you. They get jealous about those that are coming in and lately getting blessed and actually exceeding and going further than what they've done in 30 years, and they've done it in a year. So they have a problem with that. And because they have a problem with that, God says to them, if you allow that to get in your heart, God will burn that up at the judgment seat of Christ and any rewards that you had coming to you. Emulations. How about wrath? Now, wrath is different than anger. 
Wrath means that you have taken it to the point where you're sinning with it. The Bible says um, if you sin, but don't get angry. But, excuse me, uh, get angry, but don't sin, rather, I should say. All right, that means that your anger is not to step over there into a realm where you do something that is sinful, because then you're stepping over there into wrath. As a work of the flesh. You say, well, God's got wrath. Yes, but His wrath is holy. His wrath is pure. He don't have sin in His heart. You do. You have a sinful nature. So God is warning you not to step over there into a realm that you are not designed to handle. Now, I get angry at people, yes. But I have to pull myself back and say, you know what? I'm going to pray now. <laughs> I'm going to get alone. I'm going to pray. I had a situation at work here a while back where I got very angry. Amen. I got angry. And I could feel myself getting to a point where I was getting ready to say and do some things that would have probably brought me over there into an area where I would have began standing. And because of that, I withdrew and went to a quiet place so I could pray. That's how we should handle that. Wrath. Strife. There are some people in the church world that love to keep things stirred up. They love to gossip. They love to talk about people. They love to keep strife going in the Christian community. They'll make, uh, they'll take a story and they'll exaggerate it just so they can get a rise out of people. That's strife. Strife is somebody that wants to argue with somebody all the time about something. And keep that thing going and keep things stirred up so that you cannot hear the mind of the Lord in a matter. The devil says, the devil brings strife rather because where there is strife, y'all know the scripture? Where there is strife, there is confusion and every evil work. So the devil wants to keep strife in the church world so that there is confusion constantly in the church world and every evil work is open to be able to operate so that God can't do anything and bless his people. We have to make sure that we nip strife in the bud when it starts to creep in. Amen. When you hear people talk about the preacher, come to the preacher, let's nip it in the bud. When you hear somebody running their mouth about things in the church, you nip that thing in the bud by going to the uh, elders of the church. Amen. Amen. Because if you don't, the devil will plant a seed in the church that will grow and destroy the unity of the church. The Bible says in Acts that they were all with one accord. That means they were of one mind. That means that they were on the same level and same playing field. And they were focused on the work of God. And they allowed nothing on the outside to come inside and to mess them up. That ought to be our mindset. We're doing what we do because we love God and we want to see God do great things in this church this year. Amen? Amen. I know I'm going a little long. I'm going to hit a couple more here and then we're going to end. Seditions. Seditions is kind of like uh, somebody bringing in a, um, a doctrine. Uh, seditious, you know, the word we get our word seditious from that. Uh, that's somebody that turns and, and it's kind of like a, uh, like a traitor. It's like a, somebody that turns against the, you or turns against the church and they go outside the church and then they start creating chaos outside the, uh, the church community. That's a sedition. Then you got heresies. We know what heresies are. Those are false doctrines. People start bringing false doctrines into church because they know they're smarter than the preacher. <laughs> you know, they want to come in and have little private Bibles. I've seen this now. They'll have private. Uh, let's get together and have a private Bible study because we don't like what the preacher's preaching on. 
And what they're doing is they're trying to pull away disciples after themselves and start their own little meetings away from the preacher and trying to draw disciples outside the church. And basically they're trying to cause a church split. And they bring these heresies into the church. Why don't you come to the pastor if you have a problem with the doctrine? And when you come, you better come with the scriptures. Don't just come saying, I don't like what you're preaching. I don't care what you like. How about that? I care about what the scriptures say. And I'm going to teach what the Word of God says. And if you can show me in the Word of God where I'm wrong, we'll sit down and talk about it. And I'll correct myself. But you better come with the scriptures. Don't you come with a well. So I don't care what so-and-so believes. I don't care what so-and-so preaches. I don't care who's done what. I don't care how many independent Baptists don't like what I do. I don't care how many preachers don't like what I do. I'm not out to please the preachers and the independent Baptist churches, and I'm not out here to end, I'm not out here to do anything but please God. Amen. 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 <laughs> and if I cross the independent Baptist church, then they just have to be crossed. All right. Next thing here he says is uh, envyings. As again, that's like a, a, I envy you. What God's doing in your life. I envy that. In other words, you're, it's kind of like a covetous thing. I, I, want your, I want your blessing. So I'm going to do what I can to cause you to lose it and me get it. There's people out there that envy to the point where it messes their spiritual walk with God up. We're going to get into these later in detail. I'm going to teach on each one of these things later after we get on the fruit of the Spirit. I might go ahead and hit on none of these in detail. All right, then there's the murders. I know we're a little bit after today. Bear with me. Murders. If you hate your brother, you're a murderer. And you don't have eternal life inside of you. I didn't say that. God said it. If you hate your brother, you're not a believer. How's that? Try that one out for size. You say, well, I, blah, blah, blah. I, I believe in eternal security too, but I know what God says about it. Do you? <laughs> God says if you hate your brother, you are a murderer and you do not have eternal life on the inside of you. Read First John, the whole book, please. And then come talk to me about it. Murderers. How about drunkenness? There's a good one. <laughs> now, y'all know my teaching on this. I don't have a problem in the world with somebody having a glass of wine, but I do have a problem with you losing your ability to be sober. The Bible does not condemn drinking. I don't care what preacher says what. I know what the Independent Baptist Church teaches on this. Again, I don't care what they say. I care about what God says. He, he has speci specifications on what He puts as far as guidelines on this. And He says you're not to be drunk. Now, if you can't handle it, don't drink it. If you can, God bless you. If you can get down and sit at the table and pray over it at your meal and have a drink, have a drink, okay? Boy, I know it's quiet in here now. <laughs> I can't wait the next week to see what somebody says on YouTube on this one. <laughs> but uh, listen to me. I'm telling you what the Bible says. We have liberty to do it all. Now, there's guidelines on it. You're not to be a drunkard. That's number one. Don't get drunk. Number two, you're not to cause your brother to stumble in the thing that you allow. I would never take a drink in front of somebody that's a former alcoholic recovering and it would cause them to stumble back into that trap. Never would. But now if me and my wife are sitting at the house and we're at the dinner table and I decide I want to have me a nice glass of wine, I have not sinned, folks. Neither have you. Now if you feel convicted over it, don't do it. Okay? But I'm telling you what the Bible says about it. Don't be a drunkard. But now with that being said, Jesus turned water into wine. I know people say, well, that was grape juice. Show me in the Bible where that's true. Because my Bible says wine. 
It don't say grape juice. It does not say fruit of the vine. It says wine. Now, at the communion table, it's fruit of the vine. At the marriage feast of Cana, it was wine. There is a distinction between those two things, folks. And Paul told Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach sake. You think he told him to drink grape juice to help his stomach out? Absolutely not. He told him to t drink that wine as a medicine. Now, that's Bible. And if wine is grape juice, how did Noah get drunk on it? He got drunk. And that's where the problem was. He was drunk. And he opened the door for the enemy to come in. The Bible says, be not drunk with wine. So you can get drunk on it so it is intoxicating. And you can drink it and not be intoxicated. So wine is wine. <laughs> Don't be a drunkard. Revelings. That's people that go out there and riot. Hello. Christians have no business out there rioting. Christians have no business out there with the rest of the world rioting and destroying people's property and going in and breaking into businesses and vandalizing. You ought not to be doing that. It is a sin against God. It is a sin against the Lord's Word. And if you do it, your works are going to burn up at the judgment. And to such like, of the which I tell you before, I also have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not, what's that next word say? Inherit. That means there's something in the kingdom of God that you can inherit. And if you do these things, you will not inherit what God has for you. You'll be saved. Yeah, so is by fire, according to First John. I mean, according to First Corinthians three. But you will not inherit anything there. Amen. And then go home and ponder these things. The Bible says you shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It didn't say you would not enter it. It says you won't inherit something. And I ain't got time to really expound on that like I need to, but inheritance is more, it's an earned reward. Something you earn in the kingdom. And when we get caught up in these works of the flesh, we're going to lose our inheritance. And we won't be fit to do nothing but stand there and look at the Lord. But we won't have anything to show for what we've done for God here on the earth. Because there won't be nothing left to show. And I'll be burned up. Folks, when I get before the Lord, I'm going to be prostrate on my face before Him. I'm going to be thankful that I'm there. I'm going to be glad that I just made it in, yes. But I want to lay something at His feet. Because He's been so good to me. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Brother Jack, close us in prayer. We've been together this evening in your holy word. Praise you. Give you thanks for all the things and the prayer of God that you walk with us this week and that you lead us and direct us in this life. And we now do things that displease you, or we might do things that, that please you. And, and we just praise you and thank you for it. In the precious holy and righteous name of Jesus Christ our Lord, I pray. Amen. Amen.